of, uh, that he wishes to make a statement. So I'll call the Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Acting Speaker. I wish to give members an update on recent local developments in relation to COVID-19 and the rebuilding of services. Members will be aware that yesterday, for the 14th consecutive day, Northern Ireland recorded no COVID-related deaths uh, via the Department of Health measure. Whilst this is hugely reassuring, we must never forget that the virus is still here and it still presents a serious threat to public safety. And as always, we must keep those families who have lost loved ones to the virus to the forefront of our thoughts. I would like to thank the people of Northern Ireland for continuing to adhere to social distancing measures and current regulations. However, nobody can be complacent. We must continue to do our bit in helping to reduce the spread of COVID-19 by keeping your distance, washing your hands and not keep touching your face. And I would once again empathise to all those listening. If you develop any of the symptoms, please do not leave your home and instead go to the PHA website or ring 119 to book a free test. Mr Acton Speaker, I know a lot of members and their constituents were taken by surprise at the weekend by the reintroduction of the 14-day quarantine period for people arriving from Spain. This decision was not taken lightly, and I fully understand that the announcement will have caused concern, particularly to those currently holidaying in Spain. As I've previously said, uh, the international quarantine regulations and the countries they cover are kept under continual review and are liable to change. As members can appreciate, there is no ideal time to make such a decision, and a phase introduction would not have made sense, and public health considerations must take priority. The decision was taken after consideration of the latest data. COVID-19 cases in Spain had increased in recent weeks, a trend which accelerated rapidly in the latter half of the past week. I appreciate the people returning from Spain and its islands will now be faced with an unexpected period of quarantining. The Executive uh, and I met yesterday to consider what support or advice measures for employees, employers and the self-employed and what other actions may be needed. The advice from the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor is that a negative COVID-19 test immediately on return from Spain would not exclude infection, so a period of self-isolation would still be required. Mr Acting Speaker, I have to reiterate that Saturday night's decision was not taken lightly. Experience has shown how COVID-19 can be spread by international travel, and the quarantine arrangements have been introduced to help keep those people safe. Mr. Acting Speaker, testing in care homes has uh, been an issue that we have dealt with and worked through, and the department has continued to actively, actively monitor and assess the current and emerging science and evidence related to COVID-19 to further inform our approach to testing in care homes. As a COVID-19 test will only confirm whether someone has COVID-19 at the time the test takes place, the introduction of a regular program of testing in care homes is necessary and will play a significant role in helping to minimise the risk of COVID-19 in care homes and ensure the continued safety of residents and staff. I am pleased to now be able to announce a planned programme of regular COVID-19 testing for all residents and staff in green homes which do not have a confirmed outbreak of COVID-19. It will commence on Monday the 3rd of August, and this will involve testing all staff on a fortnightly basis and all residents on a monthly basis. The position on frequency of testing for both staff and residents will continue to be kept under close review and will need to remain flexible depending on emerging evidence and on the community transmission rates of the virus in Northern Ireland in the coming months. In regards to contact tracing, the establishment of an effective contact tracing service has been a key priority for me over recent months as part of the wider test trace protect strategy that you will all now be familiar with. We have an excellent cohort of professional contact tracers in place with a wide range of experience, including health professionals and staff from an environmental health background. Contact tracing will also help us to understand the transmission of COVID-19 in Northern Ireland and to reduce transmission in tandem with all our other measures. There is a strong international consensus that the work is a critical measure for bringing down the value of R and thereby preventing or minimising further waves whilst allowing restrictions to be lifted. 
The recent cluster in Limavady area was an early test for the service, and I have been reassured by how quickly the service was able to respond by making contact with all those concerned and offering appropriate advice. The workforce planning model is based on the ability to flag staff numbers up and down to deal with emergency situations as they occur, and this particular incident has highlighted the benefits of that approach. This virus has the potential to make its presence felt in any district and at any time. Everyone should act on the basis that it might potentially be in their street or on their road right now. That is why following the public health advice on maintaining social distance and ensuring the highest standards of hand and respiratory hygiene remains vitally important. And whilst I absolutely recognise that the issue of face coverings divides opinion in wider society, I would repeat the point that the medical and scientific advice is clear. Wearing face coverings in retail settings will help protect our fellow citizens. Mr Acting Speaker, I am also pleased to be able to say that Northern Ireland citizens will very soon have access to a smartphone app, which will further enhance our ability to break transmission chains and reduce the reproduction value rate of the virus. The Stop COVID Northern NI app is due to go live imminently, but the date that it will be released for download will be subject to the review process undertaken by the App Store and Google Play. The app was designed using the Information Commissioner's Office Privacy by Design principles and therefore uses only anonymised information in its operation. I would appeal to all members to encourage their constituents to download the app. If we can get significant numbers to download it, it will play an important part in augmenting the existing contact tracing processes in our efforts to stop the spread of COVID-19. I am also pleased to say that the app will be interoperable with the one already in use in the Republic of Ireland, and is also highly likely to be compatible with apps introduced in future across the UK and Europe. This will be the first instance of such a solution worldwide and will be the first example of such apps operating in an interoperable manner. Mr Acting Speaker, moving on to the rebuilding of our HSE services. When I published the Rebuilding Health and Social Care Services Strategic Framework on the 9th of June, I was clear that increasing activity would be a significant challenge. COVID-19 continues to be with us and will continue to impact on the extent to which and how we deliver health and social care services. I have been clear that we need to increase service activity as quickly as possible within the prevailing COVID-19 context. As we try to increase capacity, patient and staff safety will remain at the very centre of everything we do. Our health and social care staff have put in a tremendous effort and continue to do so as we now seek to rebuild our services. To the many citizens who may be waiting on a procedure or a di diagnosis, I will say this. We will, as a system, do all we can to make sure you get an appointment and treatment as soon as possible. There is, however, a need to prioritise services, given the significance and constraints that our health and social care services continue to face. Social distancing, the use of PPE, staff availability, and the need to plan for future potential COVID-19 surges are just some of the issues that continue to weigh on our ability to diagnose and treat patients. It is in this context that our Health and Social Care Trusts published their first three-month rebuilding plans on the 10th of July, covering the three months until the end of September. My intention that these will be followed by further successive three-month plans in due course in addition to these trust plans, work is underway to develop regional approaches to service delivery across a range of areas. All of this work is clinically led and developed using co-production principles. The Rebuilding Management Board continues to meet and will continue to oversee all of this activity, reporting directly to me. Today, I announce the way forward for two important services, day procedure centres and orthopaedic surgery. I believe it is in the public interest to move forward with the implementation of these service changes as quickly as possible. To address the adverse impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic 
on elective care waiting times and to enable the HSC to have in place dedicated treatment centres ahead of potential further waves of the pandemic. This will allow us to maintain robust infection control preventive measures at these dedicated sites to enable procedures to continue during any future outbreaks of COVID-19. While we cannot guarantee that this can be achieved under all circumstances, it should, however, give us a high level of confidence in our ability to continue to deliver these services while other hospitals are treating COVID-19 patients. I will now turn to the details of these services, uh, to the service important and the important service changes, which I have published uh, in a policy statement for elective care day procedures and the blueprint for orthopaedic care. In regards to day procedure centres, our waiting times for elective care are the worst in the United Kingdom, and that was even prior to the pandemic. Waiting times for hospital surgery were totally unacceptable. The impact of COVID-19 on the HSC has been profound and will undoubtedly be long-lasting. And I recognise that addressing the backlog of patients on waiting lists will be challenging given the reduced operational capacity across health and social care. The establishment of day procedure centres has been central to your plans to eradicate this scourge on our service. Day procedure centres are designed to provide a dedicated resource for less complex planned day surgery and procedures. Crucially, they operate separately from urgent and emergency hospital care meaning they will not be competing for operating rooms, staff and other resources, leading to fewer cancellations or operations. The Health and Wellbeing 2026 Delivering Together document provides the overall blueprint for transforming health and social care services in Northern Ireland to better meet the needs of our population. A key commitment in the Associated Action Plan was to bring forward proposals to establish elective care centres to provide a dedicated resource for less complex planned surgery and other procedures. Evidence from elsewhere shows that such centres can reduce waiting times for planned care and provide a better experience for both patients and staff. Since 2017, my officials have been working with doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, service managers and other health professionals from across the health and social care sector to consider the evidence base to establish two prototype centres and to develop proposals for a regional model for day procedure centres. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone from across the system whose combined efforts have helped us to bring us to this point and who I know are continuing to work tirelessly to improve the quality and timeliness of the care we provide. Day procedure centres are equally or even more important in the context of the ongoing pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has further demonstrated the vulnerability of having elective care and unscheduled care co-located on multiple sites. For infection control purposes, there are clear benefits in separating elective care from the more unpredictable unscheduled care. The environment in which elective care services are delivered has changed significantly in the last few months. Day procedures must now be taken forward in the context of the continued need for social distancing and for personal protective equipment at volumes not required prior to the pandemic. Consideration must also be given to the latest emerging professional guidelines and the impact of testing and isolation. Given the urgent need to begin rebuilding day case procedures to avoid further detriment to patient health, and in recognition that this will need to be taken forward on an incremental and priorities basis, I am planning to concentrate delivery initially on one hub day procedure centre. The hub site is Lagan Valley Hospital and the South Eastern Trust, and this hub will interact with several hospital sp sites, basically the spokes, which will be around Northern Ireland. Lagan Valley Hospital has a day procedure unit and it has demonstrated its ability to successfully deliver a range of day case and endoscopy procedures. 
As one of the locations on which the varicose veins prototype was delivered, it proved popular with staff and with patients in terms of accessibility and patient experience. Furthermore, throughout all of the engagement with clinicians involved in developing proposals for day procedure centres, Lagan Valley was consistently recognised as a suitable site for day procedure centre in terms of its accessibility for both patients and staff alike. Drive time statistics show that almost 73% of the population of Northern Ireland are within a one hour drive to Lagan Valley Hospital. In relation to the emergency department at Lagan Valley, the layout of this site means that there are different entrances for patients using the emergency department and those using the day procedure centre. Importantly, the two services can therefore be managed separately without impacting on each other. For the vast majority of patients, attendance at a day procedure centre will be a rare occurrence. As such, the additional travel will be an isolated event rather than a long-term passage of care requiring multiple visits. Service users are currently experiencing unacceptably long delays in accessing day case elective care procedures, so the clear trade-off for the additional travel will be for shorter waiting times for treatment. Lagan Valley Hospital sits within the South Eastern Trust and as such it will take forward the establishment and management of the Regional Day Procedure Centre model in the first instance. I will keep this arrangement under review as the model develops. I will also establish a clinically led regional network to oversee the development of Day Procedure Centre hub and spoke model based in Lagan Valley Hospital in the first instance. The regional network will be tasked with driving forward a whole system integrated approach to the delivery of day procedure centres to achieve benefits for patients in terms of reduced waiting times and improved quality and outcomes. I expect that the development or reconfiguration of Lagan Valley as a regional day procedure centre will be carried out in a phased way in order to minimise the impact on existing service users. Mr Acting Speaker, before I set out my plans for orthopaedics, I want to take a moment to express my condolences um, to the family of Kyle MacDonald. Uh, Kyle was a consultant spinal surgeon in the Belfast Trust, and Kyle tragically passed away suddenly on Sunday. He was a dedicated and successful surgeon, and a credit to his family and his profession. So at this time, my thoughts are very much with his wife, his children, his patients, and the entire family, and also with his colleagues in the health service. And I know I speak for the entire House in extending our deepest sympathies. Mr Acting Speaker, in, in regards to orthopaedics, just like day procedures, unfortunately waiting times for orthopaedic surgery here are among the worst in the UK. With patients waiting and appalling up to four or five years for operations, such as hip replacements. There is also considerable variation in practice regionally, which means that patients in some trust areas are subject to much longer waiting lists than patients in others. For a country the size of Northern Ireland, such a postcode lottery is indefensible. A new approach is needed to ensure that patients can access high quality services when they need them. During the COVID-19 pandemic, most elective orthopaedic procedures have been deemed to be non-essential procedures and have therefore been halted to ensure both the availability of resources and patient safety for those affected by COVID-19. While these measures will have an immediate positive effect on COVID-19 patients at that time, they will also mean that unfortunately other patients in the healthcare system will become deprioritised and in particular this will have a significant impact on those patients who were already waiting the longest. It is now critical to focus efforts on the regional rebuilding of the service and the reintroduction of elective orthopaedic services provides an unparalleled opportunity for positive change. It is important to understand that COVID-19 has drastically changed the landscape of the health and social care service and rebuilding will therefore require careful consideration of that landscape to ensure that services can be re-established as safely as possible. It is for that reason that I am planning to focus elective orthopaedics 
initially from two hub sites. The hub sites that I am proposing are Musgrave Park Hospital and Alton McGelvin Area Hospital, both of which would be well placed to increase regional orthopaedic services, immediately utilising COVID light facilities. Both sites provide good geographical coverage for the population of Northern Ireland in terms of their accessibility for both patients and staff alike, and they each have well established orthopaedic units which could be easily ring fenced and protected from both unforeseen and predictable increases in pressures on the health service as a whole. This would be particularly important in this phase of rebuilding. Focusing on these sites initially will allow patients to both of both lowest risk and high, highest priority to undergo orthopaedic surgery. It is important to note that this is not a plan to centralise services or to remove existing services from where they are currently being delivered. On the contrary, my plan is to utilise existing services in the best way possible at a regional level to increase activity and to ensure that resources are used most effectively. My ultimate aim is to work towards introducing a region-wide network of orthopaedic practice based on an alliance of the existing orthopaedic units to produce a standardised and equitable practice of orthopaedic medicine for all patients in the region, removing geographical variations in terms of waiting times and practice. To oversee the development of this model, I will establish a clinically led regional network which will be tasked with the regional planning and commissioning of the service across Northern Ireland. My key aim is to move towards a system where patients have the opportunity to move around the region as they wish to avail of the quickest and highest quality service that can be provided, delivering benefits for patients in terms of a quality of access to the same level of care, reduce waiting times and improve quality and outcomes. In terms of governance, Belfast Trust will host the reasonable network, providing governance and oversight of the administrative management of the service on behalf of the region. I will also keep this arrangement under review as the model develops. I believe it is in the public interest to move forward with these changes as quickly as possible. To address the adverse impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, on elective care waiting times and to enable the HSC to have in place dedicated treatment centres ahead of potential further waves of the pandemic. This will allow us to maintain robust infection control preventive measures at these dedicated sites to enable procedures to continue during any future outbreaks of COVID-19. While we cannot guarantee that this can be achieved under all circumstances, it should, however, give us a high level of confidence in our ability to continue to deliver these services while other hospitals are treating COVID-19 patients should they occur. Because of the need of these new centres to get these new centres up and running as quickly as we can, the public consultation and engagement with trade unions and professional bodies on these service changes will take place during the implementation planning stage, which starts from today. This engagement will be led by the HSC Trusts, who have lead responsibility for implementing the changes. I hope that all stakeholders will understand that because of the untenable position facing elective care services in the wake of the first wave of COVID-19, my department is taking this approach because we believe that the public interest is best served by this. Mr Acting Speaker, having published today my department's plans for rebuilding day care selective procedures on orthopaedic care, I wish to bring the attention of the House that I am finalising a further service rebuilding plan for cancer services. My aim is to ensure that we provide as much capacity as we can to deliver oncology and radiotherapy services within the context of preparing for a potential second wave of COVID-19. Because of the need to maintain high levels of infection control, it will be important to further develop the new ways of working for cancer services that emerged during the first wave of the pandemic and provide additional investment to embed these. Similarly, I am considering a plan to reshape the delivery of urgent and emergency care, along with a plan for preparing the HSC for potential further surges 
of COVID-19. I'm sure that all of this and the, all of us in the chamber can agree that it is vitally important that we ensure that the available capacity within the system for urgency and urgent care is fully utilised in anticipation of a further wave of COVID-19 and to prepare for the annual winter pressures. Mr Acton Speaker, I am grateful in regards to the health and social care framework document consultation. I am grateful to those stakeholders who responded to my department's invitation to comment on the recent temporary changes that I made to the health and social care framework document and the establishment of the management board. Having considered these responses, my department will, during August, launch a full 12-week public consultation on these changes. It should be noted that the management board, in the short period since it was established, has proved its worth by progressing three monthly rebuilding plans for each HSC trust area. The policy statement and blueprint that I have launched today for rebuilding elective daycare procedures and orthopaedic care will further regional plans at an advanced stage. While I acknowledge the concern of some stakeholders, I would again stress that the decision to move forward quickly with these temporary changes was taken to address the grave situation that the health and social care is facing and the need, therefore, to move swiftly to begin the rebuilding of services. As I have stated to this House previously, it is important to emphasise that it will not be possible to return to business as usual. The rebuilding of services will not happen overnight and it will require an agile and adaptable response to ensure that we can respond to further potential COVID-19 surges. In conclusion, I am conscious that I have taken some time to provide this update and have covered a wide range of areas. However, I hope that it has been useful and has hopefully covered a number of points that members intend to raise. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his statement, and I would call the uh, Chairperson of the Committee for Health, Colm Gilding. And just similar to yesterday, I'm going to remove my mask just to assist those who may have additional hearing difficulties um, in, in making out what I'm saying. I'd like to thank the Minister for his statement here today and just to note that there is a lot in the statement and I have no doubt that the Health Committee will want to look at uh, all of it in, in some more detail in terms of scrutiny, but um, thank him for, for that today. I also want to congratulate the Minister on bringing forward the app, which I believe you said there is the first one that's interoperable um, across across. The, the, the entire country and I think that is a, a welcome step and something that is obviously of huge importance as we work to maintain the control of the virus in the future. Um, the Minister has announced some considerable changes here today and many of which look a lot like health transformation. He has mentioned in his statement delivering together and uh, th that document which he will know refers to co-design and co-production. So I am concerned that these changes have been announced with no engagement or co-production with service users and staff. And I would just like to ask what level of engagement did he feel was necessary to, necessary to take? I would also just like to ask him as well, and I know the Minister recognises that all types of cures have been hugely impacted in this, in this, uh, t by the initial withdrawal of services, and indeed the difficulties reopening some of the day centres and respite services are placing additional pressures and ongoing pressures on those curers. So I'm asking the Minister, will he consider a one-off cash payment for curers to help with changes to circumstances and additional curer needs? Mm -hmm. uh, I thank the Chairman um, of the Committee for, for his support, uh, and he rightly indicates the extent and the depth of what is being proposed here today, but he also acknowledges that the building blocks of, of together together transforming health and all the previous work that has done, been done before. Uh, I think when I announced the, the announcement of the transformation board, I was accused, is this going to be another piece of paper that sits on the shelf? I think we've seen enough of those in health over the time. And this piece of work is about bringing together the building blocks that has been put there by previous ministers, uh, transforming your care, part of people, all that work that has been already done. And in regards to, to the co-production piece of, of both these initiatives, 
as I said in, in some of the some of, some of my commentary in the in the, in the statement, which which I had to I had to shorten because I could still have been speaking on a lot of the detail in regards to these. Um, it has been done in consultation with uh, clinicians and led by clinicians in regards to the development of the hub and spoke models. Um, I'm due to meet with TAB um, later today in regards to this. It was just in regards to the timing of the announcement of this. We have also written to the unions this morning to advise them. So the engagement of getting to this stage has very been much clinician led in both of these models using the building blocks that has already been there, but there's serious engagement that we will now be having with our trade union colleagues, with the, the professions and with the stakeholders as we move, the, move these programmes forward. But as I've made clear um, in the statement, we need to do this now. We need to make these changes. When you look at the numbers of people who are sitting on both orthopaedic waiting lists and the elective care waiting lists, we need to be moving now because those lists got longer while we were, while we were, enclosed, while we were shut down during COVID. In regards to the, the specific ask for um, CARES, I know that there is an ongoing conversation between CARES, NI and Finney and officials within my department as to what additional packages and support measures can be looked at. I think a one-off payment has been part of those discussions. I can't give the member a comment or a, a commitment at this, point of, at, at this point of time, but I know it is part of the discussions that they are having because I think it was um, the all-party group's motion I think two, two weeks ago that was brought here, the concerns, uh, and I suppose that feeling of helplessness that many carers felt was brought to this chamber. I committed that there would be engagement. That engagement has commenced, but it's making sure that we get them the provisions and the support mechanisms that are there. And as trusts start to move out in their three monthly phase building plans, they are looking at re establishing the daycare provision as well, as that is appropriate due to space, due to staff, and due to ensuring we have social distancing in place. So that, that piece of work continues to support the carers that we have in our community at the moment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Temporary Speaker. Um, can I thank the Minister for his comprehensive um, statement? In terms of travel, um, what measures are being put in place for those who have to quarantine for 14 days um, and having to face the consequences of their employers who may not be too happy? Also, in terms of contract tracing on the app, which is, which is great, great, could um, the Minister tell us how many people are involved in the contact tracing? Is there scope for more to uh, be involved in that? Um, and also, in terms of those who have uh, to isolate. Excuse me. From I think we're dealing, we're dealing with one question to the minister, so he has a choice. Yeah. Um, which one is that? So I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, I, again, I, I thank the member for his questions. I'll, I'll, I'll answer both. Uh, in regards to the urgent oral that I answered yesterday and the support measures that we are there. Um, the executive did meet yesterday afternoon in seeking what uh, reassurances or support we could give to people returning from Spain. I have, I, it was the Department of Finance. Uh, Minister Conor Murphy has confirmed this morning, I think, to the executive that anybody who had been furloughed uh, can re furlough. So there's an engagement piece there going on as well, as well with the Minister of the Economy engaging with the major employer representatives as well. In regards to contact tracing, uh, we have 92 full-time staff working over uh, a shift pattern. Uh, and as I said earlier, one of the differences that we made compared to other regions, they're not just a call centre staff, they are the professionals. There's nurses, there's consultant public health professionals on call, so that any advice and guidance that we can give when we're working through that test trace and protect system, it's appropriate advice, it's specific advice, and it can be personal, medical advice as well to make sure they're getting the, the support they need. When we saw the recent outbreak in regards to the Limavati area, we were able to scale up very quickly and bring in additional contact tracers to make sure we, we got those, all those contacts covered uh, as, as quickly as possible. And as indicated, uh, we were able to actually get to a fourth level contact um, from the initial point of, of infection. So it's a system that when we had to uh, step it up very quickly it, re it reacted well and I think it was actually a good test of everything we put in place actually worked in regards to that Limavati um, initial incident. 
just before I call the next uh, member in fairness to all members, we have an hour uh, for questions. There may be time at the end of it to have some supplementaries, so could people allow for other people coming in behind them. Thank you. Mr. Temporary Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement and his commitment to uh, rebuilding health services, especially within the southeastern area. I know that there's been an announcement of additional dozens of additional beds for the Ulster Hospital, and now today all of these additional services for the Lagan Valley. I'm going to go for the hat trick and see if we can get some commitment for the Down Hospital, which is the furthest away from other services. So, would the Minister agree with me? that facilities such as the Down Hospital are ideally placed to be able to deliver services in the future. There's a willing staff, excellent facilities and the capacity to deliver. All that we need is the department and the trust to be able to give us those services. Um, I, I thank the member for his question and funnily enough of a page all about the Down because I don't think there's been a statement or a question that I've came to that the minister hasn't, or the member, sorry, maybe preempting stuff, uh, that the member hasn't raised, <laughs> that the member hasn't ra raised the Down Hospital. And as we look to expand, I suppose, the hub and spoke model on a number of, of procedures, there should it be orthopaedics, should it be elective daycare centres. One of the things I will say to the member, at this moment in time, we will struggle to have capacity within our current footprint, because as we look to social, social distance, and we're now looking at wards, that would have had 20 beds now holding 12 beds. So it's about looking capacity as to, to how we use the, how we utilise our, our entire footprint and the down being one of them. And I'm sure the member's fully aware uh, and the, the, the respond to the question that he didn't ask that I thought he would, that the emergency department in the down hospital is planned. There is a planned opening date for it and it's Monday the 19th of October 2020, but I'm sure the member's fully aware of that. I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Temporary Speaker. Uh, Minister, it is important that this House recognises the achievements uh, that your team at every level of health and social care have delivered in extremely challenging circumstances. But it is also important to place on record the appreciation of not only this House but that of the people of Northern Ireland for the leadership you personally have shown in your six months in office. Mountains have been moved from a stand and start to saw our valued nursing staff standing on picket lines. It would be easy now for you to stand back and catch your breath, but you're moving forward through this statement with a compassionate and urgent approach to attend to those members of society currently experiencing pain, particularly in the field of orthopaedic procedures, by not delaying movement. Uh, with pre-action public consultation, but rather getting things up and running urgently in the interest of public health. Will the current postcode lottery be removed, and will your plans offer those in pain some hope that their issues will be resolved in a timely and structured fashion? Thank you. I, I thank the member for his question, but I really thank him for his kind words as well. They are appreciated, but, and as I've said many times in here, it's not about what I've done, it's about what the department officials have done, it's what their carers have done, it's what their nurses have done, it's what their cleaners have done, it's what everybody across the health and social care sector, from community pharmacy, from GPs, everybody acting on it as a team over the last six months has brought Northern Ireland uh, to the place that it is. Uh, I think the member highlights the crucial point and the underlying point to the development of these two models where we look to a regional service, not a centralised service, but a regional service, so we can remove those postcode lotteries of people on, on waiting lists, where depending on even what side of a village you live on can determine a six-month different differential on a waiting list. And at a place the size of Northern Ireland, that should not be. So in regards to developing both these models at this point in time, my intention is that we remove that postcode lottery that's so so long ha has dogged many people waiting on waiting lists that because of where they live, they have to wait longer. So these models should address that, and that's my intention that they do. I call Kelly Armstrong. The acting Speaker. Um, I'd just like to thank um, the Minister and to, um, again, pay tribute to him. I'm doing this all the time, Robin. Pay tribute to him and to all his staff and the staff of the Trusts who have performed amazingly throughout this whole pandemic. Um, I'm delighted to hear about the daycares and the respite care coming forward. Um, it's something that we had all agreed with, um, but something actually I'm agreeing with um, Chair of the Health Committee, um, Colin Gildren. Um, I'd just like to thank him about his mask, and it's about those masks. I hate them with a passion, I've said it plenty of times, but we need to wear them to keep 
ourselves, our families and others safe. Um, the UK Government has recognised the action on hearing loss um, recognition of clear masks. I was just wondering if the Minister could confirm when he's rebuilding um, our health system or building, them back, building it back better, um, is there a proportion of those clear masks coming to Northern Ireland and he, can he give us any update on those? Um, it, it's something we have been aware of since, I suppose, even since health professionals started wearing masks on a full-time basis in regards to even our interactions with um, RNIB in regards to how we communicate with uh, people with disabilities should be hearing loss, sight loss or, or, or speech difficulties. I, I don't have the detail of that, that specific uh, delivery of C3 masks or clear masks um, with me today, but I'll get it for the member because I know it's something that she has campaigned for and has raised with, with my department and with myself on a number of occasions, so I'll get her the specifics on that. I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, uh, temporary speaker, and can I thank the minister for his statement? Uh, minister, in late 2018, the department announced two prototype day procedure centres, one in Lagan Valley and another in Oma, given a good geographical spread. Uh, today, minister, in your statement, you refer to one uh, day procedure centre hub being in Lagan Valley. Uh, minister, can you outline specifically what that will mean for uh, day procedures in the Western Trust, and will there be a reduction in services in Oma? Um, I, I thank the member for his point, and it, I suppose in regards to the time I had for, for the statement, it, it will be contained um, in the further updates. Uh, the elective daycare procedures, the Lagan Valley, will be the hub for the spokes, so the provision that we have already taken place in Oma, the primary care complex and the Lagan Valley Hospital you know, for, um, for varicose veins will continue. The cataract team will continue in the Mid-Ulster Hospital, the Down Hospital and the South Tyrone Hospital. So we've proven that those elective daycare centres actually work. So it's about keeping them there, utilising them, but actually developing the model and the learnings that we got from them and actually expanding them out. Oh, Pat Sheegan. I thank the Minister for his statement. Uh, the foundation stone of any changes to our health and social care system must be co-production and co-design. Anyone who has a stake in our health service must have a voice in it. And I acknowledge that the Minister has said that uh, the rebuilding plans are based on co-production principles. Yet we are hearing from many stakeholders, including trade unions and patient advocates, that they are being marginalised and excluded from this process and are only being consulted with after decisions have already been made. Could the Minister explain that anomaly? And could he also explain why he hasn't mentioned a review of urgent and emergency care in this statement? Um, I, I thank the member for his points and their, their points as well made in regard to the engagement process we've had and the speed that we've had to move on. As I said, we're meeting TAB uh, this afternoon, I further engagement with the, uh, the health unions uh, actually on Thursday in regards to that, but we've had weekly meetings with the health unions in regards to other points. In regards to the details here, it's been mostly developed through, through co-production and clinician-led, both in the orthopaedics and the elective daycare. So this is, wide, this is wide ranging work, but it's something that we need to be moving on with, with the buy-in as many people as possible. So the engagement into, into how this blueprint, how this policy actually looks on the ground, that engagement starts now uh, to make sure that we do have buy-in, because what we can't afford is people spending longer on waiting lists while we go out to a 12-week consultation. So it's about taking the action now and actually moving forward um, with the change. Um, the member said I didn't uh, mention emergency and elective care. Um, in my statement, I, I actually did. Um, I, I referred to, if I can find it, I'm considering a plan to reshape the delivery of urgent emergency care along with a plan for reshaping and preparing for the HSC for potential further surges. So that piece of work is already ongoing. And, and I know it was a lengthy statement, maybe the member just missed that part of it. So that, that piece of work is ongoing. We, we, we are in a place uh, where we can bring these two models forward today. So I thought it was important before the House rises that I give the members as much detail, as much possibility to question uh, as potential on where we were at. So the piece of work on urgent and emergency care is still ongoing and still under work. Nicole Harry Harvey. Thank you, temporary speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement and also for your great work to date. I'd like to ask the Minister 
if he has the necessary funding and available kits to carry out the tests on the, the care homes for as long as the need exists. And I think um, that, that is actually a, a very good point that, that a member raises. When we look at the frequency that we're now undertaking the, the testing in care homes, uh, residents once a month and staff members every fortnight, it's a, con it's a considerable testing programme. We do because we have access to the national testing programme, so it's the mobile units that are supplied as part of that national testing unit that will be mostly utilised for testing in, in those homes that are green, and that's the COVID-free homes that we current ha currently have and currently see at this minute in time. And just as an update uh, from yesterday, out of our entire care home sector, we are managing and supporting only 15 homes at this minute in time that have either a confirmed or a suspected outbreak of COVID. Um, we've closed out outbreaks in 167 care homes to date. So the work that we, we are doing currently with care home providers and the staff and the residents and the families is that piece of work is actually proven efficient. And that's where the testing programme will become beneficial in making sure that we can maintain uh, those green homes in the situation that they currently are, so that we can expand uh, even our visiting access, because that is something we're conscious of has been sadly missed uh, by many residents of care homes and also their families as well. Gormi Agut, Alas Kankwalya, and thanks to the Minister for bringing this statement to the House today. Um, as the Minister referred to, obviously the decision was made regarding um, Spain at the weekend, and I think that was the right decision to make. Um, but recently in the Health Committee, we had heard that the Chief Scientific Advisor is the person responsible for looking at the, and assessing the data. Um, and I would just like to ask what this data is based on. Is it a local rate for the North, um, or a combined rate for the island, or is it a rate across Britain um, and the North? And just finally, if the Minister could confirm if there are any other areas that are currently being um, considered as a potential risk at the present time. Thank you. There's nowhere that we're looking at that we were seeing the, that I'm aware of at this minute in time that where we were seeing the incidence and the prevalence of increases that we were seeing across Spain. Um, that's not to say that something may not move as quickly as we saw in Spain, because when I said yesterday, you know, when we saw the change in positive cases, I think it was 4,400 up to a region of 9,800 in the space of a week of positive cases. That's why we had to move. The advice and guidance that we got in regards to Spain comes from the Joint Biological Centre, which is all four CMO CSAs uh, working across the United Kingdom. So the decision to remove Spain was taken by four, all four health ministers at the same time. So, um, and, you know, so it's SNP in Scotland, Labour Party in Wales, uh, and ourselves here in Northern Ireland. So that decision was a joint one was made because we couldn't uh, I suppose any differential could have left a back door somewhere um, that could have been opened or accessed, so we made that decision on a UK-wide basis. Can I begin by offering my condolences to the family, friends, colleagues, patients and community of Kelly MacDonald, an esteemed orthopaedic sur uh, surgeon and consultant, a past pupil of my old school, the Abbey in Newry, Kyle's sudden passing would have sent shockwaves through all the people who knew him. Um, my siblings are with them all. Imagine Eve Groshe. Today also marks the passing, uh, part, marks a year since the passing of another Abbey student, and that's Brian Conlon. And my thoughts are with Julie and um, Brian's family, his colleagues, and family and community. Minister, you mentioned the reopening plan. Um, and the, the plan to reshape the delivery of urgent and emergency care, but you have not referred to Daisy Hill Emergency Department. I do note and applaud the exceptional work of the Trust and all the, the staff of Daisy Hill and Kirkgavan Area Hospital in, in dealing with this pandemic, and the work of the Pathfinder Group um, in ensuring that there is a plan to, to restart Daisy Hill Emergency Department, and they have included that in the first um, reopening, rebuilding plan, um, and it's scheduled to happen before the end of September. Um, I know that nurses, doctors and other staff, hospital staff, have been displaced through this pandemic. I know that it will not be a return to business as usual, but can you give a firm date as to when Daisy Hill Emergency Department will reopen and give the people of Newry Morn, South Armagh and South Down some comfort? 
Um, thank the member for uh, his initial comments as well in regards to, to Kyle's family. Um, the Southern Trust are working to reopen emergency medicine in Daisy Hill Hospital, and that is by the end of September. And as I think the member has, has rightly profiled, the Daisy Hill Hospital Pathfinder Group are working in partnership with the Trust to develop new models of care in line with other emergency departments in Northern Ireland to ensure that services are safe. As with all of the restart programme, the new models of care will require considerable engagement with the community to ensure their success. So that, that piece of, of work goes on in regards to the rebuilding projects that each trust are bringing forward on the three-month um, stage process. So the engagement has been there, the Daisy Hill Hospital, the emergency, emergency medicine will reopen in Daisy Hill Hospital by the end of September. Call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Temporary Speaker. I just want to uh, thank the Minister for his lengthy statement today and his service. And, and he quite rightly pointed out the, the good work of not just his department, but those who have served on the front line. And it is, it is good as an MLA from Lagan Valley to, to note that the Lagan Valley has been uh, recognised today for its capacity. Uh, for its reputation for excellence and its central location to provide the hub for these elective procedures moving forward. I would just ask the Minister a, a simple one today. Would he, would he agree with me and join with me in thanking the staff of the critical care unit who actually uh, changed their unit into a COVID response ward and at great cost to themselves actually performed heroically and uh, just to be on the record of, of thanking those and those like them throughout the, the, the health service here in Northern Ireland who have stepped up to the plate at this challenging time. Again, I, I thank the member for his comments, and I, I, will, add, I will add my personal um, thanks to the members that he, he does mention, because I said, as I said earlier, we are where we are today in Northern Ireland in, res in respect of COVID and the response of COVID because of the dedication of so many health professionals at all levels um, across our service who really stepped up to the mark and really delivered and really proved the benefits of a national health service and what it actually means to the people of Northern Ireland. So, you know, for each and every individual who stepped up, I say thank you, and it's a personal thank you as the Minister of Health that I, I give to each of those for the dedication, for the commitment they gave, but also always remembering of the sacrifices that their families made as well, and allowing those loved ones to go out to work, which was al al always um, in difficult, trying and challenging times. I call John uh, thank you, uh, uh, Pretty Blossom and Claudia. Um, Minister, we're approaching the 31st of July, and, and the Minister will be acutely aware that shielding ladders are those who are shielding the, the, the advice to those members of the public will now change, and, and they will be able to go out and about more. Uh, and, and one of the, the reasons why people have been advocating the wearing of masks uh, in shops and other places is to help protect those who are shielding. Uh, what ad further advice or what advice has been given to reassure uh, those who are now uh, coming out of shielding uh, about the future and uh, particularly the concerns they have that they may have to shield again? Um, and I thank the member. The 31st of July will be a very joyous day for some, but it will also be a very challenging day um, for many uh, as well who have been shielding over the past four to five months, and we'll see that challenge of coming back out the front door and entering society, a society that looks different from when they started to shield. So the guidance that we are providing is, is in regards to um, the letter that went out from the Chief Medical Officer in regards to still social distancing, good hand hygiene, respiratory uh, awareness as well. But also I think the biggest guidance isn't to the people who have been shielding that come out, but it's for those who haven't been shielding. It's that request that I think I, I, I make on behalf, I make uh, as health minister, but I also make on behalf of family members, of friends, and everybody else who has been shielding the 98,000 that we sent letters to. You know, please respect them. Please give them space, and please allow them to re-enter society at their speed. Giving them space in shops, giving them space in retail, giving them space on public transport, giving them space in the footpath to allow them to come back out into the general population as well, because it will be challenging. Um, we undertook a piece of work by the Patient Client Council who engaged uh, with all those who were shielding, uh, and their biggest concern was actually stepping back outside the front door. So there's also the mental health implications as well of those people who have had that surety and assurance of staying inside their homes. 
Um, but what I would say to the member, we've been very clear as well, that our guidance on the 31st of July is a pause to shielding, and that is deliberate. It was deliberate language that was used at the time, because we do have to be aware that we may have to ask a section of that 98,000 to go back to shielding again should we see a second spike or an outbreak of COVID-19 in certain areas, that advice may have to go back to advise and guide people to stay in their own homes for another period of time. I'll call John Blair. Excuse me. Thank you, temporary speaker. Uh, can I begin by associating myself with the thanks uh, given by my colleague Kelly Armstrong to the Minister, departmental staff and um, healthcare providers everywhere. Uh, and we truly are grateful to the Minister to be commended for the way he shared the thanks today with those frontline staff, I have to say. Um, mindful temporary speakers, we all are, of the autonomy of GT practice, GP practices. Can I ask the, the Minister, um, uh, who will also be aware of the struggles the public are facing currently in trying to get GP appointments, if there is a likelihood that we will resume face-to-face -face appointments, bearing in mind the difficulties faced by those, uh, particularly many of our elderly, who cannot easily access online or sometimes telephone services. Uh, and again, uh, I thank the member for his, for his initial comments. Uh, the member will be aware that GP practices are independent operators. Uh, we've been able to give guidance on, on support, but at the end of the day, the, the provision and how they give it uh, remains within the, the management of e each of those practices. We've always been reassured that if anybody needs a face-to-face -face consultation, they should be able to get one. There have been changes that have been made in regards to telemedicine, telephone consultations that should be utilised where possible. But if someone needs to go in through the door and actually see their GP, that facility should always be there because it's not always the initial reason that somebody goes in the door to see a GP. It's often that point where they're actually just about to go out the door with their hand in the handle and they say, oh, by the way, I meant to ask you about and that's where the real reason for that GP appointment actually comes to light. So the importance of face-to-face -face is always there. We've said there will be changes in practice in regards to telemedicine, telephone consultations, reordering and repeat prescriptions, things like that. So there are good practices that have come into place in regards to their GP services, but that face-to-face -face interaction should always be there if necessary. Call the Lord Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, uh, like others, I join and uh, thank you and your, the staff throughout the health and social care system for their hard work throughout the pandemic. Can I refer particularly to cancer services? I spoke yesterday to a young mother who had a routine smear test last December and has now been told she has cancer with only within the last two weeks, but there's no date yet for her surgery. So you were talking about the restart. And so I'm just wondering about the time lag between diagnostic routine tests and people being given uh, their diagnosis and then having to wait for their surgery. What measures or confidence can you give uh, to people like her who are facing such dreadful news? I, I will say, say to the member, if she wants to write to my office with the specific details, of that case I'll have it looked into, but as, as I said earlier in the statement, the, the re-engagement of our cancer services is a priority that we have had uh, in regards to getting them re-established as soon as possible. The specifics in regards to lag between diagnosis and treatment shouldn't, shouldn't be, and, and my knowledge shouldn't be as, as lengthy as, as the member has, has indicated, so I'll have a look into that because we were always undertaking a number of, of red flag and urgent procedures were always being maintained even through the pandemic because we made provision for those. We weren't getting them all, but we were getting the majority of the urgent referrals. So I'll pick up that if the member wants to indicate to my private office and follow it up for him. I call Steve Egan. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Uh, temporary Speaker. Uh, may I thank the Minister for all his hard work and also for his department and all the hard work, man at work with the working healthcare professionals. But the question is for the Minister, could he outline how he has managed to deliver a functioning pan-border Stop COVID NI app that is globally unique? And how could he also thank the software industry for the hard work they've done in delivering this? Because this is indeed, members of the Assembly, one of the most unique things that we're actually seeing across these countries. Thank you, Health Minister. Um, and again, I thank the, the member for for raising that, that, that specific point that was also, I think, echoed by the chair of the committee. In, in regards to the contact tracing app, um, 
I suppose we, we, we started with a foot in both camps. We were watching what the Republic of Ireland was doing, but also conscious of what NHS X was doing. So the Chief Digital Information Officer and his team within my department, uh, Don West, who presented to the Health Committee and the Executive Party, uh, the Executive Committee last week in regards to this app, I thank him and his team for doing an astonishing piece of work for a very small, dedicated team that has delivered uh, the app that we will be launching hopefully so shortly once we get it onto the, the, the Apple Store and go through that provision because not only have they developed it, they've also made sure that the concerns that many members raised in regards to data security, data sharing was also at the centre of, of what we were doing. So that, that small, small team led by Don West needs commended as, as any other health professional, any other member of my department and what they've done. But the key point, and I think one of the, the interesting points and one of the integral points about our app, is that interoperability, where we will get that ability to access information from both sides of the border, so we don't see an anomaly, which was the concern at the start, that people would either have to have two or three apps to travel throughout, throughout this island. But what was also reassuring as well is that the platform that NHSX are now progressing on will allow east-west interoperability as well. So we will have an app that will work across all these islands. It's working internationally. And at this moment in time, my understanding has even progressed that it will then interact with some of the main European apps as well, the likes of Germany and other countries as well, because we're using the same platforms. Call Daniel McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Temporary Speaker. I thank the Minister for his statement of provide, providing updates to this House during this pandemic, uh, and uh, in particular for the important issues that continue to be raised uh, throughout it as well. With regard to elective care, Minister, specifically orthopaedic surgery, the Department has received an additional £90 million earlier this year, and the Executive will receive a total of £600 million uh, of new money from Westminster to tackle uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Can the Minister then outline what total additional funding will be allocated to elective care to ensure surgery and appointments take place? And also, Minister, what, could you update the House on what work has been done, aside from obviously the importance of tackling COVID-19 uh, to ensure that waiting times are reduced from the four or five year time period that has been told to people out there? And again, um, one, of, one of the points and one, I, I hope, of the, the outworkings um, of both the orthopaedics and the elective daycare surgery is a reduction in those waiting times because we have, they were bad in January. They got worse over the period we were closed down for the pandemic. So this regional approach should start to tackle the waiting lists that we're currently at to get those reduced and back into a place that, that is that is manageable, is respectable. So the four or five year waiting times, we need to get on top of, we need to bring them down. It was a challenge that was already within my department. It was already promised, and there's money promised under new decade, new approach to address those. It was a 50 million, we got 10 um, in the last build. But what we were looking at that, at that point in time was using the independent sector, enhancing you know, further provision that we already had. Some of those avenues has closed down. So although we may be tackling, um, the waiting times that we currently have it will not be at the extent that we we previously hoped and in regards to bid all these proposals have been worked up and costed and there will be, will be bids going into to the department of finance and the finance minister in regards to the announcement of the new COVID support monies um, that have come forward but in regards to to waiting times the important point is and i ask members to to support us in this and that's encouraging people to look across Northern Ireland to a place where they can go to get their, their procedures, their operation, um, their diagnosis. You know, let's, you know, let, let's break that regional perception that it always must, must be in your local hospital. I would rather that people look at their access, now look at their access uh, to medicine in days, weeks and months and miles rather than years. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Temporary Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement today and all the hard work and health staff for their ongoing work um, in our NHS. 
The Minister will be aware of the impact of coronavirus on maternity service and antenatal care. And according to the latest information on the maternity website, the South Eastern Trust uh, said that all education classes are cancelled and there is no information on this statement or on the uh, online on when they will resume. Parenting classes are extremely important to supporting the pregnancy journey and are part of a wide range of services that are essential for women preparing to give birth. So can the Minister provide an indicative date for when he expects a resumption of normal service provision for antenatal care and maternity services? Um, I, th I thank the member for her point. I, on straight out, I, I don't have that answer with me today, but I'll get it. Uh, for the member, because I do realise the importance of, of the issue that she, she does realise is one of the services that was stepped down was, was I think there was an attempt to make put it online for access and for mothers so they have that guidance, but there's nothing like the, the personal attention of a midwife in preparing for, for, the, for the birth of, of, of a child. So I, I don't have the specific date for the member, but I'll get it to her in regards to how that's been worked up across all the trusts as well, not just the ones you mentioned. Call Jerry Carroll. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for his statement. Um, it's indeed welcome news that there's been no uh, deaths in the last two weeks. Um, but as the Minister indicated, the virus is still with us and very much dangerous. Uh, can I ask the Minister his and his officials' assessment of the safety uh, of all pupils returning to school without wearing masks, particularly those teenagers and older uh, pupils? Uh, if not, the executive is certainly understand the minister's uh, position that people should be wearing masks in shopping centres, and it appears that the education minister could be going on a solo run uh, uh, that could put, put people at risk. So, I would like to ask his assessment of masks for pu pupils and staff um, in schools. I think I thank the member for for his point in regards to to the interaction with with the education minister. Um, I'm having a meeting with him this afternoon in regards. Uh, also with the Chief Scientific Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor uh, in regards to the next building plans and opening up of the Education Authority and other schools as well. And I'm sure that issue will be, will be discussed. That's all the members we've had so far. Uh, we have some considerable time left, over 20 minutes. If there are any other questions, uh, just show. Okay. Uh, Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I think like it's going to be called so quickly, but I'm glad to be called. Um, the, I'd like to ask the Minister the issue of um, uh, strike pay for healthcare workers. Um, we're being led to believe on the Health Committee that it's sometimes it's with the Finance Minister, sometimes it's with yourself. So to ask his assessment where it's at, and does he still believe that uh, healthcare workers uh, should be getting strike pay that he lost out uh, earlier this year? Thank you. Member, I thank the member for his question, and I think it even reflects back to a question he asked even prior to COVID, just after the strike. I think he asked me what I'd like to see the strike pay reimbursed. I indicated to him at that point in time in regards to the legal uh, ramifications there may be. In regards to the reimbursement of strike pay, what we're actually looking at in the department uh, at this moment in time, although the, department, the Minister of Finance, the Department of Finance, has supplied us with the money, is the repercussive nature of reimbursing strike pay. This would be the first time that strike pay would ever, had ever been or would ever have been uh, reimbursed. So it would set precedent, not just for Northern Ireland, but across the United Kingdom as well. And where that would hit the Department of Health because of the repercuss of nature, uh, if we were to do that as a policy lead, if, say, for example, the, the member raised education, if teachers went on strike and the Minister of Education decided to reimburse strike pay to teachers, the bill would come to my department because we were the one who set uh, the precedent. So where we are at this minute in time is I have a paper uh, with the executive committee. It was last tabled, I think, on the 9th of July in regards if the executive takes the collective decision to take um, that I suppose unique step as reimbursing strike pay. It's something that can be proceeded can be proceeded with. It will be a, it will take a while to be able to work that. We have the money, but what I need is the reassurance that any future reimbursement of strike pay from another department, either in this jurisdiction or across the UK, does not come back to impact the health budget of Northern Ireland, which is currently our our understanding. So at this moment in time why we're not proceeding is because I need that reassurance from the executive that should this ever happen in the future, that the Department of Health and my budget would not suffer for that decision. 
call Rachel Woods. For Mr. Temporary Speaker, and the Minister will be aware that there are ongoing issues for many people um, in accessing physical appointments with their GPs. And I have written to him and the South Eastern Trust on this issue. Some of my constituents have been offered telephone appointments, which have not resulted in any diagnosis or referral, and some have been told that they should probably go private as an option. So, can I ask the Minister, at what stage will the resumption of GP services with all the necessary PPE and safety measures, if there is an indicative date for when the next stage of recovery programme will be announced? And again, I think and I can refer the member back to the answer that I, I, I gave to, to John Blair or their own regards to you no know, GP interaction on the services provided. GPs are independent providers. We have supplied them with PPE. Um, anybody who should get a face-to-face -face appointment should get one. But we have moved in certain cases to telephone or online triage services. But in regards to you know, advising people to go private. It's something if the member wants to give me the specifics for that. She said she had written to me. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where it is in the system, but it's something we'll certainly look at. But I would encourage GPs and encourage patients as well if they do need to see a face-to-face -face consultation that it should be open to them. I call Callum Gillan here. I can call you Charlotte Hack. Um, Minister, you you. Uh, you have referenced in the statement around the travel regulations, and, and it has been widely accepted that there has been a great degree of confusion around travel regulations. And I welcome the fact that you have sought closer cooperation with your counterpart in the South in order to try to streamline some of those uh, issues. And I suppose it's very important to say that this is South North as well as North South. And if we're going to truly maximise the benefits of having a single epidemiological unit, that work will be, will be crucial. I wonder, could you give us an update in terms of the memorandum of understanding or any other work that's going on to ensure that we can deliver in as far as possible on, on the aims of the Independent Age Better Way document, that we work together to reach as close to zero COVID as we can possibly reach in, in as soon a time frame as possible. Thank you. And again, I, I, thank, the, I thank the member for for his question, it's actually one of the very few that I had a prepared answer for. <laughs> so, um, in regards to the Memorandum of Understanding between the Departments of Health uh, in Ireland and Northern Ireland that was signed on the 7th of, of April, uh, signalling the willingness of both jurisdictions to promote cooperation and collaboration in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, both jurisdictions are committed to working in partnership to predict the likely impact of COVID-19 and to enable evidence-based decisions on how best to respond across the island of Ireland. We have been working closely with our Irish colleagues since the start of the COVID-19 crisis and shall build on this relationship to continue to share information and learning. There are regular scheduled meetings between the CMOs of both jurisdictions and their teams to discuss areas of, of mutual information. In regards to the member specific, I think I said to him yesterday, I, I slightly went off course with the member's question. There's a North South Ministerial Council meeting um, this Friday, which will discuss the memorandum of understanding and should there be any further, um, I suppose, relationship buildings that we can do, considering the new government um, is in place. I had a good working relationship with Simon Harris as, as the, the previous health minister. I have a number of engagements now with Stephen Donnelly, Donnelly and they're very proactive and, and very engaging because we both have the same challenges in regards to how we tackle COVID and how we, we rebuild our, our services as well. So there's a good piece of work going on in regards to the travel to cater forms. We have had some challenges in regards to the sharing of information. I'm now led to believe that that's with the Attorney General within um, the Doyle as to regards to how that information can be shared so we have progress or there is progress being made in that. I don't think it's a matter of not wanting to but not being able to at this moment in time. So hopefully Friday's discussion will be able to, to, to get a solution to that problem and we can move on because we have had a good working relationship between myself as health ministers, their chief medical officers and the PHA and the HSE as well. So that working relationship has went well and it's something I think we can build on. Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Temporary Speaker. And uh, also, again, Minister, just to put on record my thanks to you for uh, your leadership in relation to the huge challenges that have been thrown in you since being placed, uh, uh, appointed as Minister. Uh, can I ask you, Minister, to continue to reinforce your message of hand sanitisation and, and uh, hand washing? It's very important, and it's important that message isn't lost or fade. Uh, in relation to mental health services, Minister, you'll realise that uh, throughout this pandemic, there's a huge amount of people that have been very bad 
badly impacted as a result of it. There's people that are fearful, uh, that are anxious. Uh, all that feeds into uh, their uh, mental health uh, uh, situation. I'm just wondering, Minister, what extra funding will there be, if any, from the £600 million, uh, from Westminster for COVID monies uh, that may support uh, mental health services that are so badly in need of it at this present time? Uh, thank the member. Again, the point is well made because of the stresses and strain that we've seen what COVID has, has put on those, not just the people who are shielding, but also the people working on the front line and their families as well. Um, I think of the last modern round, there's a, a, a bit of 1.5 million was put in and accepted in regards for the mental health strategy, um, which we kept on going, which we kept the work going, and we published uh, last month as well. So that I, that. Mental Health Action Plan, sorry, apologies, was actually adopted and includes a COVID-specific uh, piece of work as well. And since that point in time, we've been able to appoint um, our mental health champion, uh, Professor Siobhan O'Neill, who, who is doing a fantastic job um, already in, in interaction with stakeholders and all departments as well. One of the further bids now with the additional monies that, that's coming is what we're actually looking at is putting in um, further applications for... Uh, the development of the multidisciplinary teams, which were working across uh, a number of areas in Northern Ireland, which were able to bring in different professions, including psychologists uh, and psychiatrists as well, into a GP practice. So that model had worked well. We didn't have the funding to expand it to other areas, so there will be additional money sought in regards to how we expand that. But it's always, it's always dependent on having the professionals and the people there actually to fill those posts. It's not about just the money, although the money is always welcome, has been making sure we have the right people in the right place at the right time. I call our Leah Flynn. Gormi Yogurt, I'll ask Con Colia, and just to follow on, I suppose, from um, Mr. McCrossan's question, and I don't want to sound critical towards the Minister, um, that's not my intention, uh, but the Minister will know that I did come out publicly after the, the modern round around that 1.5 million, and although the 7 million for the, the multidisciplinary teams. To me, it still wasn't enough for, for you know, what we need to, the challenges that we're facing around the mental health. Um, so my question would be, because it did come up at the Health Committee last week as well, around the trauma and the psychological impact, we still haven't seen you know, what, what's to come next. And the Minister had referenced in the Mental Health Action Plan, there is that section around the COVID-19 response. And I know the report had um, quoted that that was a fluid piece of work that would change. So I'm just wondering, is there anything else concrete, uh, you know, around what actions um, is under that COVID-19 mental health response? Thank you. Okay, uh, I, I don't have again the detail with me because of, of the scope of the statement we, we, we were covering today. But I, I'll get the detail to that. But it's something that uh, the executive committee on mental health, well-being and suicide prevention actually meets tomorrow again. So as we come out of even the executive's uh, response to COVID, you know, those additional strands of work are being put back in place. So there's a number of presentations to it in regards to work that is coming forward. And that even includes you know, members from the voluntary and community sector. Um, I think the Youth Initiative Elephant in the Room is also pre pre um, presenting to the committee tomorrow afternoon as well. So it's about how we, how we get all those pieces to work together and the support that we do need as we come out of COVID and see more people you know, presenting with, with the challenges that we need to be there to support. And I know it's something that the member continues to raise and has a passionate interest in, and I, I commend her for that. And keep, you know, never worry about the but that comes in your statement. Keep bringing it, keep asking it, because it's only by raising those concerns and those questions in this chamber that allows me to keep it firmly on the platform, not just within my department, but also that of the executive. Colm um, Would the minister commit to meeting with the, um, the BDA and this chief dental officer to address the serious impact that there is on the uh, dental uh, practices at the moment as a result of the regulations. They have made many representations to the committee and to members, and it really there is a, a threat to the viability of practices going forward. I know that he has extended the urgent dental care centres to the end of August, but I do not want to get to another cliff edge at the end of August with those problems. Uh, and would he undertake an assessment and meeting with those individuals to be able to try and resolve any problems going forward? I met with the BDA and the acting chief dental officer, I think, about two to three weeks ago. Um, at that stage, I had quite a good engagement with them. So some of the stuff, that's, uh, some of the fallout and some of the comments that I, I, I've seen recently uh, were my takeaway 
from that meeting, I do understand uh, the pressures that our, our dental profession is under this moment in time. The acting chief dental officer is due to meet them and engage with them in regards to a number of funding packages, but also to be aware, and I'm, I'm not even sure if the BDA is aware, um, in regards to the additional monies that are currently, currently there in, in support for for other industries or other other service providers, I think, that have fallen through the gaps, I think, is how the Finance Minister um, has, has described it. I've, asked, I've written to the Minister of the Economy uh, to see if there's some sort of support me mechanism that she could also bring forward to the private health uh, side of our dental profession as well. So where we can support and fund the, the national health side, there's also that private side of many BDA businesses that need the additional supports as well. So that engagement has, has commenced because the BDA had actually written to FMD, FM and the executive uh, as a whole, I think, last week. So that's the step that I, I took in response to that letter. Um, uh, in my haste to get two questions in the first time, I, I probably didn't frame my question around uh, urgent, urgent and emergency care too well. And I suppose what I was asking for, uh, does the Minister have a date of, of when that review is, is going to be published? So that was the last question. <laughs> this question relates to plans for care homes in the event of a second surge. And I know in your statement today you have outlined plans for uh, extra testing in care homes. But in terms of a second surge, are there other plans in place to deal with it? Um, I I think you know. I think I thank the member for his clarity because I wasn't sure because I had mentioned it in the statement. Um, I, I hope to be in a position to publish that if, in August, if not September. So in, again, uh, I know we're in recess, and I don't want members thinking that I'm doing it because we're in recess and it's a good time to do it. When it's there and it's in a final position, I'll do it. But I'll also make sure we're engaged with the health committee as well to make sure they have. Uh, interaction and, and and some input and knowledge of, of what has been done. So August. Hope, hopefully, September at the latest should be when that that urgent emergency care piece will be will, will be published. In regards to to care homes and the supports that we're getting, um, one of the things we've been you know, and it's looking at best practice across all jurisdictions in regards to the support of care homes. So the chief nursing officer is leading a, an urgent review uh, in regards of the provisions that were put in place, not just here in Northern Ireland, but in other jurisdictions, even worldwide practice as well. To see what additional measures can be put in, you know, but it's at what point you stop visitors, at what point, you know, it's all those different challenges, um, and it's all those different steps that bring about different challenges as well to to residents and families as well. So it's making sure that the care homes are provided. I think we will be in a better place than we were at the initial outbreak in regards to what we know about COVID and how it works and how it interacts with, with care homes. And we have now established, I believe, a good working relationship with the care home sector in regards to how, how we work together to make sure we, we protect and support the residents of those homes. With just over six months left, and with the uh, indulgence of the Minister, I know Callum Gillenew has indicated, is there anyone else? Show it. Okay. And, and, thank, and thanks again to the Minister for taking, for taking the, range of, the range of questions on all of the issues. It is a kind of a linked one to the one that, that Pat has asked, asked in relation to the care homes. And I know right across the islands there has been a sense that there, there are, we could do better in terms of care homes in, in a potential second wave or in potential future pandemics. So could I ask the Minister in relation to that, is there any specific look being taken in relation to discharge policy? Into, into hospitals and out of hospitals into care homes that may be of benefit in a potential second surge. I know there's work being done across the water in England in relation to that, and I'm wondering is there work going on here in specifically in relation to discharge policies in a second surge? Yeah, and that is um, that, that is as part of the work that the chief nursing officer is is leading on in regards to the number of of admissions and discharges from hospital settings into care homes in regards to testing policy, because we did have the testing policy in place you know, 48 hours before discharge from a hospital and uh, care home, at what point that actually come in. You know, if there is an additional second surge, that will be there from, from the very beginning. You know, so that policy has been established, because we were asking 
you know, for people transferred from hospitals into care homes about the isolation for for the 14 days or seven days as, as appropriate. So you know those steps and measures are all being looked at in the review, the rapid re review that the chief nursing officer is bringing forward. So it's it's something we're cognizant of, something we're, we're doing the work on, and it's something will be part of that review. I can't read so good. Brief speakers, it's great to get so many questions, and I thank the minister for answering them. So, just with regard to the rollout of the COVID-19 app, and I welcome this. It's been done in conjunction with the ICO um, within the announcement. I had previously raised questions with the minister in terms of legal advice for the rollout and data protection. So, with regard to the collection and storage of the data in the app, can the minister confirm that this is based on a decentralised model where data is only held locally on your phone? Um, you know. Uh, I thank the I thank the member for for her question because it's fortunate it's actually another one that I had an answer prepared for unlike most of the the rest of the hour. Um, in, in regards to 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 the actual application and, and where that data is stored, it is stored on the member's phone. It's only when you get there actually enter the key and fire the key that that information is shared with a secure server that's held within the the business service organisation that would be developed specifically developed and, and managed in regards um, to that. In regards to them, the interoperability with uh, the Republic of Ireland, that's done then by secure measures as well to make sure that they both, they both do talk and they both do, do act together. So we have taken, again, a, a, wide, piece of, a wide piece of engagement. Um, and just to reassure the member as well that the, the draft data protection impact assessment for the proximity Proximity app, uh, while it's currently being finalised to take accounts of comments from the Information Commission's officer, will be available and will be published just to give users and, and those who know what that actually means the ability to, ha to have a look at it uh, before we go live. So it gives that, that reassurance because one of the things that I want as, as Minister and I think that we want as an Assembly and the Executive has as many people using that app as possible because it starts to open up a whole lot of other avenues as we use restrictions as well. I call John Blair for a very quick question. Thank you, uh, Temporary Speaker, for your patience and the Minister for, for his perseverance. Um, uh, the, the Minister touched on his statement, uh, and we're grateful for the statement, on, on uh, the resumption of cancer services. Um, it's reported that cancer diagnosis is down by somewhere around two thirds. Cancer Research UK are saying as many as 300,000 people across the UK are not being screened for cancer, such as bile, breast, or cervical cancer. Um, can we have any more information today through you, temporary speaker, on what is being done to prevent a high number of cancer, uh, early cancers not being detected? Um, again, I, I thank the member um, f f for the point because it is a valid one, and I think it ties into Dolores Kelly's point as well. In relation to screening, um, the strategic re framework for rebuilding XSC services was launched in June with the aim of directing and rebuilding the health and social care services uh, within prevailing COVID-19 conditions. So, in relation to screening, it outlines a phased restoration of screening programmes as quickly and as safely as possible. So, the PHA is leading on the restoration of screening and has produced a recovery plan for each of the PAUSE programmes to ensure they are reintroduced in a safe way and that the benefits of screening are greater than the clinical risks associated with COVID-19. So, given the ongoing pandemic and the continued need for enhanced infection control measures, screening throughput is likely to be slower and it will therefore take some time to catch up on postponed appointments and to restore services to pre-COVID levels of activity. But I can assure the member that that piece of work is also ongoing as well to make sure we catch up on what has been, what has been missed. That concludes questions to the, or the statement to the, for the minister. And I, with, with some seconds, that, that, and I thank the minister for his indulgence. I'm going to ask members to take a raise until we uh, get ready for the next item.